Throughout the many decades of space exploration, the use of chemical propellant has enabled spacecraft to explore other planets in ways that people once thought impossible. But in a grand scheme of exploring our solar system and going beyond it, this can ultimately only get us so far. Enter electric propulsion. Instead of using chemical propellant, these systems propel a spacecraft by using electromagnetic forces to accelerate a gas. How freaking cool is that? So electric propulsion, or EP as you'll hear it abbreviated, is the future of propelling spacecraft into deep space. Now one reason for that is that they don't require large heavy propellant tanks like traditional propulsion systems do, which reduces mass greatly. This also makes EP significant for small spacecraft like CubeSats, which can provide meaningful scientific studies at a low cost and low risk, but are incredibly limited in volume, and don't have room for a large propulsion system. One more key driver behind EP is that by creating thrust using electricity, we can enable propulsion systems to last longer, which is essential if we want to be able to explore more of our universe. So all of these areas and more is what we will be exploring in today's episode of The Art of Space Engineering. Welcome back to another podcast episode and more adventures in space engineering. I'm your host, Sarah Rogers, and today I was fortunate to sit down with my old professor from ASU, Dr. Daniel White, who has done a lot of incredible work in this area over the course of his career. So Dr. White now teaches at Emory Riddle's campus in Prescott, but he used to teach at ASU, which is how I met him a few years back. In fact, Dr. White actually spent a few years as the faculty advisor for ASU's Sundable Satellite Lab, which is a student organization that I was part of throughout my entire undergrad career. So given his expertise on such a cool topic, I thought it would be really great to do an episode on the fundamentals of EP. And well, he made the mistake of saying yes, and well, here we are. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. We, we both had fun just completely nerding out over propulsion. This conversation was really great. Uh, I, I had so many questions on this topic, and over the course of a few hours, we really got to dig deep into what it takes to actually develop EP systems. Now, because there's so much great content here, I actually split the episode up into two parts. So part one introduces what types of electric propulsion systems are used on spacecraft and why you would choose one over the other, along with the physics behind how each of these work and how these systems are designed to help meet mission objectives. Part two continues the discussion on design, but also dives into testing and some really interesting research in material science along with lessons learned. So there's so much to learn from these episodes. I'm really excited to share this content with all of you. So without further ado, let me introduce you to the magical subject that is EP. We're good. We're good. I'm guessing. Oh, that sucks. I don't know why this doesn't. Oh, that's why. Does it work now? Yes, I've got you now. Cool. Okay. I bought a handy dandy microphone for all of my podcasting adventures. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> I, uh, I went the cheap route and got this little guy from Walmart, so it's probably my fault that you can't hear me. Oh, no, you're fine. <laughs> How are you? Uh, how are you holding up uh, apart from school and all the rest of the stuff? How are you personally doing? Not bad. Uh, some some days are better than others. More productive. Um, this has kind of, I guess, helped, kind of keep me motivated that's and great. stuff. Um, so that's been nice. But yeah. Yeah, it's really fantastic. Yeah, I, I think everybody's having those up and down days. I mean, we just take it a day at a time. Yeah, I think that's the that's. Probably the motto for 2020 is <laughs> take it one day at a time. I actually, I bought a, they sell these dumpster fire candles in the shape of a dumpster fire. <laughs> so this, is, this is my 2020 commemorative candle. I will find one. Where did you get that? Do you have somebody you want me to buy those from? Uh, to, <laughs> no, to it's, it's online. I don't, someone posted something on Facebook and it was just like a, a meme of like, oh, my 2020 commemorative candle has arrived and I was like well, I need one of these immediately <laughs> I promise you as soon as we get off this call I'm gonna go on Amazon see if I can find one <laughs> that's great but yeah no thank you so much for doing this with me I'm, I'm really excited for this conversation maybe you'll kind of um, persuade me to the dark side of, of EP rather, oh yeah <laughs> rather than my, my yeah than my usual uh like systems engineering background so okay but yeah. um, cool 
but I figured, so let's start off by kind of getting to know a little bit more about you. So why don't you tell us a bit about your background and, you know, what you do now at Embry-Riddle and what you've done uh, previously in places you've worked at in the past, and then we'll go from there. Okay, sure. Uh, well, my name is Daniel White. Um, uh, for anybody that's listening, uh, I, was, uh, I taught Sarah uh, thermodynamics um, as a part of her undergraduate career. Um, so that's kind of one of the ways that we got to know each other. In addition to that, I was the faculty advisor at ASU um, for their Sun Devil Satellite Lab, SDSL. Um, right, so I was Sarah's uh, advisor there for SDSL as well. So we've gotten to know each other a little bit over time. Um, my background um, is in electric, uh, electrical engineering, believe it or not. I, I started off at uh, Texas A&M as an undergraduate electrical engineer. Um, I was convinced to leave my first love of launch vehicles by my high school physics teacher. He explained to me that I would make a lot more money as an electrical engineer, so I thought that was the thing to do. Um, the good side of that is that uh, because I wasn't feeding that part of myself, uh, my intellectual curiosity, that was so inter interested in aerospace and uh, astronautics, I wasn't feeding that through classes. I spent just a ton of time at the library. I feel like probably um, I, I, I think not taking classes may have actually been good for my education because it really forced me to kind of seek out the information that I wanted and learn on my own. Whenever I got accepted to MIT, I, I figured, you know, all right, I gave this, you know, this good advice, electrical engineer uh, path a, a shot. I think really what I should be doing is, is kind of working in academia. Um, I, got, uh, I got accepted at MIT. I, I spent a couple of years in deferral when I worked at Lockheed Martin. That afforded me a, a lot of opportunities that I really hadn't thought would be in my future. Um, really got to work on a lot of interesting programs, uh, especially in the missiles and fire control um, uh, area there. Um, uh, different, some different programs that you probably heard of. Um, the, 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 mo the one that I'm the most proud of is uh, I spent some time uh, in, in Chelmsford. Uh, Massachusetts working on uh, guidance hardware for the Patriot Advanced Capability Missile, the PAC-3 missile, and also the tactical high altitude variant of that uh, that's meant to intercept intercontinental ballistic missiles. That program is called THAAD. Um, so I was kind of, I was, uh, you know, played a role in that as well. Um, I ended up staying on at Lockheed Martin while I was doing my undergraduate career at MIT. And uh, for anybody that's kind of looking for some advice in terms of building your career and moving forward for young people, I highly, highly re dis uh, unrecommend that. I recommend that you not try and go that route. Um, I feel like I didn't get as much out of my graduate career as I might have otherwise, and I wasn't delivering to Lockheed Martin as much as I, I might have otherwise been able to. Uh, so trying to serve two masters is, is uh, a compromise at best. Anyway, um, while I was working at MIT, um, I had a, a wonderful opportunity to kind of go through and uh, do some of their uh, coursework, um, and by do, I mean TA some of their coursework. Um, in particular, one experience that I had there that I thought was really neat was um, I was a TA for a year for the uh, Unified Engineering Program at MIT, and essentially what it is is it's a gazillion credit hour class that you take, and it's five days a week. You go and you sit down every day for five days. Um, we tell you from the outset which of four uh, sort of principal areas of study we're going to focus on, but you don't know which one you're necessarily going to get every single day. Uh, in the syllabus, we, we try to set it up so that we have day after day, but in reality, we all know how classes go, right? You don't really know uh, what you're going to get any day. It could be fluids, thermo, it could be structures, or it could be signals and systems. So you just go and uh, it's a couple of hours every single day. It was, it's, a, it's a very grueling process. Um, they make it a pretty open secret that it is intended to, to sort of get, uh, to sort of What's the, what's the uh, politically cor correct way to say it, Sarah? It's uh, we don't want to say weed out. It's um, <laughs> to encourage students who maybe right. not um, completely uh, sure that they want to be an engineer. It's to expose them to an extremely high workload, uh, like a like a practicing engineer might see, and then say, okay, this is what it's really going to be. Are you sure this is where you want to go? Um, so it's kind of a it's kind of an assurance. Um, uh, at the end of Unified, if you make it through, that, that was a really neat experience for me. Um, and working with uh, with Manuel um, Martinez Sanchez, my uh, my academic advisor, I think he's probably got to be just one of the most graceful, um, kindest human beings on earth. And I don't want to uh, take away from his ability to smile and eviscerate you in 
intellectually because that is absolutely what he can do. Uh, he's an extremely <laughs> capable man. Um, but generally what I found working with him is he's one of the first people that I've ever worked with, uh, Sarah, that whenever he, whenever he has this magic about him because you'll go to talk to him as a part of your graduate experience. You walk in the front door and you know, you're kind of nervous because Manuel's there. And even though he's a very small man, he's actually a giant that looms hundreds of feet in front of you. Right. So you sit down in front of him and uh, you sit there and talk and, you know, he's very kind and affable, really nice guy. Um, and you don't realize until after you leave the office that he essentially just told you that you need to go back and sit down with your your fundamentals of engineering and ask yourself if you really know what the heck you're talking about at all. <laughs> and you almost leave the office with a feeling of, oh, I'm so glad he did that. Thank you. Thank you for telling me that I was being a moron. You know, <laughs> it, it's, it's a really magical kind of thing. I think that's what makes a lot of the folks at MIT special is, um, is that sort of um, personality. They're just really, really special people. They're, they're at the same time, they're this really weird mix of very smart people. And I would say not everybody's, I mean, everybody's different, but on, by and large, they're also extremely kind and nurturing people. And that is not a combination that you run into very often. And I can tell you that that had a huge effect on me because if I had to point to any particular set of behaviors that I want to emulate personally in, my, in every walk of my life, um, the kinds of things that I learned from Manuel are the kinds of things that I've carried with me and that I want to emulate uh, for my students. I do a crap job at it. I taped a Lego uh, to somebody's uh, uh, report in my uh, space systems lab last semester because I was so darn mad at him. So I'm not exemplifying Manuel in the way that I want to. <laughs> I'm not doing that, but I am striving for it. I am trying. Um, other parts of my background, I mean, you can probably tell uh, just from kind of talking to me, I've got this uh, this accent that I've worked so hard to get to, to kind of tone down a little bit, but you know, you're, you're kind of stuck with it whenever you have an accent on your mind. Um, anyway, uh, Hopefully it's endearing. People have told me before that it's endearing. It doesn't make me sound like I'm from the trailer park. So I hope that's true. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's kind of it. I come from a really, really small little village in southeast Texas called Evadale. Uh, whenever I was growing up, uh, um, a, a little anecdote that I, I kind of like to tell about myself is, um, you know, we lived in a very, very rural area. Um, nobody, including us, was uh, was very well to do, very wealthy out there. We were all a little bit uh, on the on the poorer side. Um, the property that my parents had bought <clears throat> um, and we built a house on had an old cow barn in the backyard, and they had talked about tearing it down. And I think that probably was secretly their plan. I was a kid, so I don't know what the parents' plans were. But um, whenever I went back there and and kind of started playing in the cow barn, I found this huge. Um, floor standing ice chest freezer. It was an industrial chest freezer. Probably um, the, they had used it to refrigerate milk, I would imagine, uh, as a part of their operation hundreds of years ago. Um, but uh, anyway, I found that uh, chest freezer and an old washing machine, and by God, I started building a, a spaceship out of it. I had a 55 gallon drum that I was going to fill with gasoline awesome. And shoot out the out the hole in it until I was probably ten years old or so. I thought for sure that is how I'm getting to Mars. I'm taking <laughs> there's no other there's no other options for me. I am taking this refrigerator to Mars, and I will learn what I have to to to, to make that happen. And uh, I I didn't quite didn't quite live up to my own expectations in that case. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. I love yeah. that. I I never went as far as like making. Um, like rocket ships. Uh, I just made forts in my yeah. living room. Um, yeah, for sure. But it's where your imagination takes you, Sarah. I mean, you know just as well as I do that all I had was a, a freezer fort, basically. Mm -hmm. a pretty cool fort because I had walls on it, right? But um, besides that, it was just a fort. And just like you, um, I was I was using my imagination, you know, to mm -hmm. kind of take, take me the rest of the way, so to speak. So would you go it's live hard. on Mars now if someone just said, hey, I've got this rocket ship, let's, let's just go? Um, we need to do that. Yes. Um, I, would I be able to do it? I don't know. Um, I have a couple of kids and I need to think if it's really in their best interest to take them off world. One of the things that um, I've learned in 2020, um, despite my own social shortcomings and the fact that I don't have very much social wherewithal, despite that, I'm seeing how just how absolutely critical uh, social engagement really is for our mental health. Um, it, it, it's uh, really taking a toll, I would say, on most of the nation. 
mm -hmm. uh, right now being so cut off from each other. The fact that I can't be, you know, in the same room as you, breathing the same air as you while we're talking, you know, that's, that's a, that's detrimental to it's all bizarre, of us psychologically. Yeah. Yeah. And whenever I think about going to Mars, I wonder if we're not signing on wholesale for, for, for that. I wonder if maybe we shouldn't take um, 2020 uh, and, and take a long view on, on it and say, what does that really teach us about what it's going to be like to go to other planets? Because we're experiencing firsthand globally, I would say, intense loneliness. And look at how detrimental it's been to us as a population. Yeah. Uh, yes, I would go to Mars. Um, I think that it's going to be very difficult for people like me because I have very small children. So whenever we start taking very small children to Mars, that's going to be that's going to be intense. Or if we start, I mean, the more likely thing, Sarah, is that uh, mm -hmm. humans will begin making small humans on Mars. And whenever we have kids on Mars, however they get there, that's we're not designing our Mars bases for three-year-olds. Right, <laughs> right. Um, so that's going to be a tough thing. But if I had to, if I had to say yes or no, give me your life savings, go get on a rocket. I think I would try and talk the fam into it. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, so what what got you interested in space in the first place, and and wanting to build the the rocket ship out of the the refrigerator? <laughs> Um, it was human connection. Uh, a lot of the reason that I would go back out into the uh, into the cow barn and play with the freezer is because I was imagining um, um, being a part of a crew. Um, that was all of my little school friends. We were all going to, and people, you know, just imaginary people as well, imaginary friends. I think everybody does that. Um, we were all just going to go to Mars together. And um, that feeling of of closeness and personal connection uh, that I got out of it. And, I mean, we were six and seven, so I wasn't fantasizing about spending time with my friends and sort of not telling them. We had a space club, and to get in, you had to be able to say the name of all the planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, like that. <laughs> um, and then you could be in the club, and it was all of us. We were all going to go. Right? And that personal connection that I got out of my little, my little team or my little crew, that little group of friends that I had that we were in the space club and everything that made me feel so centered. And I was also, um, you know, Star Trek, the next generation was airing on television at that time. And I'm not going to lie. I mean, I'm a Trekkie. Uh, it had a huge influence on me and it, but it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily the, the pretty blue warp nacelles glowing. It was the way that the crew behaved. It's the way in Star Trek that you see humans represented as forming relationships with one another. I think that it uh, it really captures this this hope or this idea that we have that space flight makes us better. Trek really captures that for me, and I wanted to I wanted my 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 group of friends, our our little crew. I wanted us to be that better. I wanted us to live that kind of a life together, and and. Uh, I guess in the, the reason that I truly became drawn to space flight is because that human connection, that closeness got somehow in my neurons conflated with the idea of we are better in space when we are striving. And when you put those two things together, there was no other option for me. I mean, this is, this is what makes my heart beat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. What about you? <laughs> do people, do oh. people who listen to your podcast know what got you into space there? No. Um, actually, so like my childhood was very different because I don't know, but I, I wasn't really, I didn't really start like knowing that I liked math and like physics and engineering until I got much further into high school. So like when I was a kid, I always thought that space was cool, but it was always this kind of very far off mysterious thing to me. And I, you know, I wasn't reading books and watching TV shows uh, about space and my friends weren't doing that either so I wasn't I didn't like I, I love that you had that that really close-knit group of friends I think that's awesome um and but yeah my my friends and I just like to do other things and then uh as I got older and I started thinking about you know what do I actually want to do <laughs> like I have to go to college what do I want to do in college um I don't know I I that's when I I had started reading a lot more nonfiction books and I they just happened to be more on space because I realized that it was always this very fascinating thought in the back of my mind and it was always like when I looked up at the sky like it was just the, the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen but I I don't know I never thought I think now you know you and especially because I'm in college you see a lot of students who are 
pursuing space exploration and doing a lot of these cool projects. And now you've got high schoolers and undergraduate students making CubeSats and um, I don't, space for everybody feels a lot more, it, it feels closer. I uh -huh. feel like it doesn't feel like this far off um, thing like it did to me when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, it, you know, the, people are actively participating in it now and, and that's great. Um, but yeah, when I, when I was a kid, it kind of seemed very far off and not like something that was attainable for, for me coming from kind of like, I mean, Tempe was a lot smaller back then. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, like I was, um, yeah, it was, it was just my, me and my mom and I, so we, you know, um, my, my house wasn't like influenced by science and all of this other stuff. I, I kind of had to figure out what I liked through school. But yeah. Good. That's awesome. I'm glad that, uh, I mean, you need to say that out loud. Uh, mm -hmm. That's really what um, the educational process has done for you, especially nowadays, because we're having this discussion about uh, whether or not, I mean, realistically, I hope we're going back to school and we're doing it for real and we're not going to call the semester off. We don't know what's going to happen. Everything seems so unpredictable. Yeah. But there are folks who think we need to have a discussion about whether or not we should we should go back to school and you've got a president who's tweeting in all caps, open up the schools and things like mm -hmm. in, in a time like this, I think we need to really point out uh, and, and be specific about some of the things that you just said, because um, you are really blossoming into what is going to be a force in our, in our landscape, in, in the space landscape, so to speak, uh, here on earth. Uh, and, um, you know, without, without your educational journey, there's, I, I think you have, you have mentioned that there's some question, would you have ever gotten here? Would you have ever become, you know, an advocate for the things that are, we're all so passionate about? I, I don't know if that's true. So when we think about opening up the schools, I, I understand that there's a public health issue there as well. Um, but just remember that, you know, we need this to figure out who we are and who we can become as well. Um, and I, I hope that everybody is kind of keeping that. You just exemplify those principles. Yeah, I, I agree. I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, it's, we have to, we have to adapt. Um, yep. That's, that's what we do as people. So I guess to, to circle back around to um, a, a little bit more of your background, like, did you, you wrote, did you write a book on electric propulsion? I found something on Amazon. Oh, and it was uh, like a survey and design oh, of high powered right. space. Yeah, sure, I did. Um, that's my, uh, that's an adaptation of my thesis. Oh, okay. I'm asking yeah, we were, um, my first love I mentioned was rockets and launch vehicles and things like that. Um, whenever I got to graduate school, um, I realized, I had realized by that point through my own personal like, ed educating myself, uh, I, I realized that uh, rockets are, are essential. They're, they're how we get to space. But then the second half of how we get anywhere else, um, that part's a little more difficult. Really, uh, chemical propulsion can take us to the moon and it will take us to Mars. Uh, whether that's a good engineering solution or not. Uh, chemical propulsion is probably, in my mind, going to be a, a huge part of what takes us to the planet Mars. Uh, it's going to be a big part of, of landing. But whenever we try to go further afield, whenever we really try to uh, sort of invest ourselves in the cosmos at large, um, to move between large bodies in, in the solar system, we're going to have to have higher exhaust velocities uh, for, our, uh, for our rockets. And I'm sorry to immediately jump off and start getting technical. Um, okay. the, the exhaust velocity or the, the specific impulse is um, uh, a lot of folks call it a measure of how efficient uh, a, a rocket is. So the space shuttle main engine that most people are uh, familiar with um, had an ISP of around 430 to 400, maybe 50-ish uh, seconds. But we're definitely somewhere in the neighborhood of the 400s. Um, specific impulse uh, kind of gives you some indication for how much propellant it's going to take you to get from point A to point B. So think about that huge red external tank on the space shuttle. The reason that we needed that enormous uh, thing that had to be uh, ferried in, uh, you know, to, uh, to Louisiana there uh, every time we needed to have a, uh, uh, a launch, uh, the reason that we had to uh, ferry that external tank in is because the specific impulse of oxygen and hydrogen, even though it's 450 whatever per seconds, is very, very low. It is enormously low. So because you're working with chemical propellants, you're using chemical energy uh, as your source of uh, enthalpy or as your source of jet kinetic output power. 
Uh, since you're using that chemical energy as your source of jet kinetic output power, the, the chemical bonds uh, are what they are. What I'm trying to say is, if I wanted to increase the specific, inter, uh, the specific impulse associated with oxygen and hydrogen, I would have to somehow make the bonds between those chemicals more energetic. You can't do that, right? Chemistry, um, uh, that's not something that, that, that's allowed. You can't make bonds more or less energetic to any appreciable degree. Um, so how do we get around this speed limit, basically, the exhaust velocity limit? Well, the answer is you shouldn't be using chemical energy to accelerate your reaction mass. What you should be doing is, is using some other energy source, like potentially electrical power. Um, so electric propulsion, a lot of folks are maybe a little more um, acquainted with some of the, the principles of electric propulsion than they realize. Um, fundamentally, for most of the electric propulsion thrusters, uh, hull thrusters and gridded ion engines especially, these are relatable to people. Um, these things use electrostatic forces um, to accelerate a gas. So how many, I mean, how many of your listeners must have, uh, must have had this experience where you rub, you know, your hair with wool or something like that and you, you free up a few electrons and you're pulling your hair? Mm -hmm. um, so certainly, here it looks to anybody who may take a photo of that and, and step out of the context of the situation, the experiment you're doing, it would look to that person like your hair was defying gravity. And the reason for that is there's an electrical force, there's an electrostatic force that's being exerted on your hair in order to pull it against gravity. Well, we can do that wholesale in electric propulsion thrusters, we pull instead of uh, your hair, we pulling on your hair follicles there. Uh, mm -hmm. What we do is we pull little particles uh, that are charged. Uh, these, these are particles of gas. The most common gas that we use is xenon. Uh, we use xenon because it's really, really big, kind of a bulky one. Uh, it's safe to handle, stores pretty nicely, uh, and it's easy to ionize. So what we can do is we can uh, make a static charge. If you imagine that, cloud of static uh, electrons there on your hair when you're doing your experiment, we can create that in the engine, but in the, uh, the chamber of a gridded ion thruster, and we can ionize uh, whatever medium you want to work on. Now, all of a sudden, whenever you've got an ionized medium, those electrostatic forces suddenly start moving the whole gas. At that point, when the gas is starting to respond to electrostatic forces, we call that a plasma. So that is, that, that, that's kind of how we go from just a neutral gas that doesn't really care that I've got all these electrons around. I don't feel those electrons. We ionize it, and now all of a sudden, just like your hair follicles get pulled up, all of those xenon ions say, oh my gosh, there's this huge electrostatic force over here. We got to go, guys. We got to go. So that's how it accelerates your, um, your, your ions, and that's how you, you get um, your exhaust velocity, your ISP. Uh, we motivated electric propulsion by saying, well, geez, you know, you can't increase the bond energy of an H2 and an O2, right? It is what it is. Um, electric propulsion uh, takes, us, takes us kind of further along that circle because uh, it turns out that we can vary easily by turning a knob on the power supply. We can vary how much electrostatic force that, that xenon ion population, how much are they, how much force are they being pulled by? That's the voltage, the, vol the potential drop uh, that they've got to fall through. So by varying that, we can effectively say, if we have a huge potential drop over here, think about it like a waterfall. The xenon uh, ions are, are, are just gonna rush over the waterfall quickly. They're gonna accelerate and they're gonna go very, very fast, exit the engine uh, and, and things are good. If I turn that, uh, that power supply down to a really low voltage, benign voltage uh, drop, they don't really see a huge motivation to go there, right? So they, they kind of accelerate, but they, they do it at a, a lower magnitude. Uh, the magnitude of their acceleration is a little bit lower. And as a result, whenever they leave the ion engine, they end up with a lower velocity. Um, uh, why is that important? Why don't we just always go for the best ISP we, we can? We said that that big external tank um, uh, for the space shuttle at 450 seconds of ISP, uh, we said that you need this e enormous tank so you're telling me now that I can vary the voltage and all I've got to do is, is make more and more and more ISP. This sounds uh, incredible. This sounds like something that sh shouldn't obey the laws of physics. You pay a price. That's the answer. Mm -hmm. You pay a price. Whenever you change, whenever you turn the ISP up, remember, power is a product of a voltage and a current, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the flow of xenon ions is a current. Anytime you have charges flowing, that's a current. So if I want to, and, and I know that I've got a power, um, V times I, so I can either choose to flow, if, I, if my power is fixed, like I've only got one solar array that I can't magically make bigger, 
say. Mm -hmm. So I'm in a fixed power situation on a solar powered satellite. Power is fixed. So I can do one of two things. I can say I want to I want to flow a teeny tiny amount of current, but I want to do it gangbusters. I want to go a gazillion percent of the speed of light. Um, okay, that's fine. Uh, if you want to do it that way, you get one xenon ion per second. That's how fast we can go. Um, if you want to go the other way and you say, well, I want to lower the voltage to, you know, a thousand seconds of ISP, some number you specify, there's going to be a corresponding change in the current. The, the critical last link in the chain that we need to understand here is that current is thrust. Mm -hmm. Current is where you're getting momentum um, uh, change for your spacecraft, right? Um, if you do opt to go to extremely high values of ISP, you can. Nobody's going to stop you you're going to have a thrust that is absolutely minuscule. It's going to take you thousands of years to do whatever delta V you're trying to get uh, out of your spacecraft. Uh, and delta V is the velocity increment. It, it's going to take you longer to get from point A to point B effectively. Um, so, the tra so electric propulsion takes you out of the realm of being totally limited by nature. And instead, it elevates you to the status of now having an undesirable choice to make. <laughs> <laughs> so it gives you options, but it gives you hard ones. Um, it turns out that there is a um, um, there is uh, an optimum sort of an ISP uh, specific impulse, depending on what mission you want to do. Okay. So that's really neat for us as engineers because now we don't have this ambiguity anymore. Oh my gosh, I've got a mission. I can dial ISP up to infinity, but I'm gonna I'm gonna pass away before my mission is over. Or I could I could dial it all the way down, but then I've got to carry so much propellant uh, because my ISP I've dialed it down too low. Uh, you know what do you do? Uh, it turns out that this was a, a problem that uh, Ernst Stoyer uh, uh, took up um, in the uh, the 1930s or 40s. I I don't know. Um, but it was right around the, the time of World War II. Ernst Stuinger was one of uh, Operation Paperclip, one of the Operation Paperclip guys with Von Braun. Uh, okay. He was sort of uh, the father of, of electric pulse. Stuinger uh, kind of tackled this problem and found that there really was an optimum ISP for any mission that you want to do. So say you want to go to the moon, your optimum ISP is X, and, and you can sort of do some simulations. He gave some pretty straightforward calculations that make some uh, kind of questionable assumptions. Uh, but it, it gets you in the ballpark uh, of the right uh, ISP for, for your optimum. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think whenever I was taking electric propulsion with Manuel, uh, he called it the, the Stuhlinger optimum ISP uh, for emissions. So we would ideally sort of like to try and design our engines uh, so that they're operating somewhere around that optimum ISP. So that's what really makes electric propulsion an engineering field instead of a science. Right? Everything I've talked to you about so far with how they work, all just science. I mean, it's plasma physics. Why is this thing an engineering marvel instead of just a physics marvel? Well, we now have as human beings, uh, as the human species, we've collected enough physics and put it all together in just the right ways that we can design electric propulsion systems, these plasma physics, plasma accelerators. We can design these things so that they do a job for us. Not only do they do a job for us, they can do a job for us better than the old way, better than chemical propulsion. Um, so that's why I, I really think that uh, electric propulsion, kind of as an engineering uh, uh, field, it, it really is, um, it has progressed, I would say, in the last 20 to 30 years, 40 years maybe even. Uh, to the point where it is an engineering now. It is no longer just a, a science. <clears throat> That's so cool. I never, I mean, when I was doing my initial reading to kind of understand this topic more, I never, I didn't, um, nothing presented it like that. So I, I, I love that. Um, well, so where would, where would you like to go? I mean, that's the best <laughs> I can do for, for the physics of EP. Um, no, that's in, in a, great. In a, oral thing like this. So where would you, where would you like to go from here? Okay. So, so kind of going off of the introduction, you, you said that the ISP is normally chosen specific to the mission is what is that? What is it normally based off of? Is it just, um, cause like if you want to go to the moon, you're going a shorter, shorter distance than say going to Mars. Um, is, and it's, is it just based on, you know, if you're a flyby versus an orbiter? Um, it, it depends on, uh, 
Will it depend on if you're a flyby or an orbiter? Yeah, uh, it will. It depends more fundamentally on the velocity increment, the delta V that you need for your whole mission. Oh, okay, so if, if we're doing uh, sort of mission design at JPL or something, uh, someplace like that, and I want to go to uh, planet Starbucks, um, then we're going to know how much delta V it's going to take as a function of ISP to get there. Uh, and, and once we know that delta V, um, Stuhlinger has given us this formula that wouldn't be worthwhile to go over in, a, in an audio format like this. That's He's given us this formula where if we know how much delta V we need, uh, that's one critical piece of information. Uh, we can put that in and we're on our way to finding the Stuhlinger optimum. Um, the other thing that you're going to know, you and I are going to know when we're doing this mission design, delta V, yeah. We're also going to know the amount of allowable time that taxpayers are willing to wait before they oh, get right. the data back. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah that's so cool. that actually shows up as a term in, in Stuhlinger's optimum. Um, so yeah, I mean, if we know uh, an approximate delta T um, and uh, about how much delta V we need, then we're, we're well on our way. If we know a few things about our power system, like its specific power, and if you remember from thermo, anytime we make a quantity specific, we're dividing by mass. So mm -hmm. if you have specific power, you know, you have watts per kilogram. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, it, it's, that's the critical metric for sizing your power system. So if your solar array is really, really lightweight and producing a good uh, 1.21 gigawatts, uh, then it's going to have a fantastic specific power. It's going to have a really great number. Um, uh, maybe, uh, maybe, you know, kilowatts per kilogram, maybe one day we'll get there. Uh, I think uh, these days, um, if you just need a number to kind of uh, baseline your thinking around, uh, sorry, multi-junction solar cells, um, I think are doing something like 100, uh, maybe like 120. I, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, somebody look, uh, Somebody certainly, one of your listeners, hopefully will look that up and confirm that that really is the, the case. But, uh, watts per kilogram was the unit on that. I did bad engineering. Uh, so that's about 120 watts per kilogram. I remember um, at another company I worked for, our solar arrays were 62 watts per kilogram for a fully integrated solar array. Just to give you what uh, an idea for what that value should be. If you're using a nuclear reactor, maybe that's something that your listeners are into. It's certainly something that I'm interested in. Uh, if you're using a, a nuclear reactor to develop megawatts, maybe maybe you do even better with your with your uh, with your specific power. But that figures into your ideal ISP. I also like to encourage a lot of times students whenever they're going through and trying to understand these equations, like equations for Stirling's optimum. Uh, not only should you know what terms you're looking at, but you ought to also um, develop some intuition or come in with a hypothesis. Uh, about how the how the Stuhlinger's optimum would vary with the different quantities that you're prescribing. If you give me, for example, more time to do a mission, um, it ought to be intuitively obvious to you that that means I can turn down the current in my thruster, which means I can turn up the voltage, which means I get higher ISP, lighter propellant tanks, all that. So you ought to figure uh, that if we're using Stuhlinger's optimum as a way of approaching what our optimum ISP for a mission is, if we're, if we're using that sort of chain of reasoning, more time equals higher ISP equals less propellant, probably also equals more tax cycles. Um, uh, you know, so you have to fund yourself for longer, mm -hmm. and that's the downside, right? Um, in, in terms of specific power, that alpha, um, one of the ways to understand that intuitively is alpha is, is basically telling you how much of a penalty your power supply is costing. Um, what I would love to have is a power supply that masks nothing. Uh, that, that's the perfect solution. And then my, my EP engine becomes a UFO because I get instantaneous, almost instantaneous acceleration everywhere I go. So anyway, um, you want a really, really great value for specific power, really a large number of watts per kilogram. Um, the same thing, um, uh, you know, can, can be said for other variables that show up in those equations. But I really like it whenever we can develop an intuition for those things. They should, they should just make sense to us. Mm -hmm. So is that kind of, I don't know. I'm trying to think of a good question because like power, I mean, batteries are only so large and, and solar panels are only so large and all of that leads into like cost and mass and, and what have you. So I'm trying to think of like a good question on how you go about trades for it. But I, a, a great question. I mean, something that I would love to see us kind of focus on and make sure is happening as far as NASA and funding agencies go is um, in order to do better missions, I mean more exciting missions, better in terms of more exciting. Mm -hmm. um, in order to do those more exciting engines, we uh, missions, 
uh, we need to develop lighter power supplies, more advanced power supply technology, because it's going to let us leverage EDP in a way that we haven't been able to here before. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, a, a great um, kind of thought along that uh, that line of questioning, that line of reasoning is, uh, you know, if anybody's if anybody's really looking for uh, key technology to fund that is a support technology that's just going to make our satellites more robust, our mission capabilities enhanced. Um, these lighter weight power supplies are, are absolutely the way to go. They drive us to higher ISPs, reduce the propellant loads on our spacecraft. Make, and effectively, what I'm saying is to the payload guys is I'm saying I'm I'll, I'm offering you more payload. Give me lighter solar arrays. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway. So we brought up a couple of different types of uh, electric propulsion. There's Hall thrusters, ion thrusters, pulse plasma, pulsed plasma thrusters. Try saying that five times fast. <laughs> oh. um, what leads you to choosing one over the other? Is it more just based on what kind of ISP they can deliver or? Um, I think you really have sort of hit it on the head there. Um, right now, there is a, uh, I like to tell my students that right now we're embroiled in a historical battle in the field of electric propulsion. Um, I, I, I draw the analog to uh, the time whenever we were developing, uh, you know, the NERVA nuclear engines out at, uh, at Jackass Flats in, in Nevada and all those test sites out there uh, where they were firing these honest to God nuke. I mean, I don't know if everybody knows this in your, in your listenership, but uh, any of you guys that are interested in propulsion, definitely you should be, no, you should know um, early on in the space program, we didn't know if chemical rockets were going to win, so to speak. We didn't know if chemical rockets were going to give us what we needed to get to space. And I'll say out loud, they really just barely did. I mean, mm -hmm. It's hard to get to space, like Sarah was talking about earlier. It seems inaccessible. Uh, at this time, we didn't know that chemical rockets were going to win. It was equally up in the air that nuclear might have been the right way to go. And uh, my goodness, we, we had a lot of, uh, of tested, you know, not flown, but but tested on the ground, uh, nuclear rocket engines that were test fired. Um, what was the original question? I got so excited about the nuclear <laughs> rocket engines. Uh, what, what is, uh, what's the difference, or what leads you to choose one type of thruster over another? The, uh, the historic battle that we are embroiled in, uh, in electric propulsion, the analog to that chemical versus nuclear rocket, we're in, embroiled, I would say, in an analogous uh, war whenever we think about uh, hull thrusters versus pitted ion thrusters. Uh, you definitely have companies like um, Busick um, uh, really does a fantastic job. They're just an, an amazing uh, place. And uh, Vlad, uh, Vlad Ruby that, that runs the company was on my thesis committee at MIT. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, whenever I, whenever I pass my thesis, I'm not ashamed to tell you um, I'm um, Vlad had some serious pushback for me about some of the hall thruster modeling that I was mm -hmm. that I was doing enough so that uh, he asked me to go through and make some changes and I did. Um, but uh, you know, really, really just incredible people out there, music, and they are uh, uh, at least uh, in their history. Uh, they they seem to be moving in a, in other directions as well, branching out just like uh, every industry uh, should it doesn't should. Um, but uh, uh, their their origins kind of early on were with some of these hull thrusters, um, and they really do um, produce ISDs that optimize around a lot of missions that we like to do right now, uh, missions that are kind of Earth orbiting missions. So right now, hull thrusters are a really, really beautiful uh, implementation technologically for many, many, many missions. I, I would be surprised if we go another 20 years that every single spacecraft that goes into space doesn't have a hull thruster on it for attitude control or for uh, momentum dumping or something like that. Uh, they're gotcha. just an incredible solution. And, and principally, I think that's associated with their physics. They, they optimize around a, a certain ISD um, because of other engineering considerations, thermal being one. Mm -hmm. um, contrast that with a mission like Dawn. Everybody probably is going to listen to your podcast and knows everything about Dawn. Uh, it's, it's mission to go to Vesta and to then jump off and go to the series. Uh, and, and we're probably all very aware that uh, that used uh, a gridded ion thruster. I think uh, John Brophy at uh, uh, JPL is one kind, another one of these unique individuals that is simultaneously just Christ-like kind, a hugely kind person, uh, but also um, always the smartest person in the room no matter where they go. It's, it's just this unique thing. Uh, 
uh, Kim Manla, hey, many of those people out there, uh, Dan Goebel is another, uh, they all kind of share these, this common characteristic they've got. Um, anyway, uh, they, uh, uh, jo John Brophy was the, um, I think, the uh, manager, the program manager, whatever they call it in their parlance, uh, for that uh, Dawn engine. Mm -hmm. um, and I think largely that the gridded ion thrusters make a lot of sense for these um, interplanetary missions where we're doing exploration. Um, and it's because of their physics. They also um, sort of optimize around a different ISP regime than hull thrusters do. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's not deeply invested and deeply acquainted uh, with some of the trade-offs in EP may not, uh, may not even think to ask the question, um, why or does maybe a gridded ion thruster make as much sense uh, in, uh, in, in a particular mission versus a hull thruster? Like on maybe geocom satellites, one thing makes sense and the other doesn't, or uh, there are some commercial um, uh, investors here and I, I don't really want to uh, say too much, but uh, I don't want to get out of my lane, so to speak. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, it, it does appear at least from, maybe I've already gotten out of my lane by, by, by talking too much physics. Uh, different EEP systems optimize around different ISP ranges and logically feed into uh, different applications. So in interplanetary travel, uh, what we've got is gridded ion thrusters at, at higher ISPs because they're producing higher velocity increments over much longer periods of time. It all seems to make sense. In, uh, in, in low Earth orbit, on the other hand, where momentum dumping may cost us satellite time, which isn't good, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, where we have uh, tight situations like that, Time is of the essence. We already intuitively know we want high thrust. We need the efficiency of EP though, so we're gonna use a hull thruster, not a gridded ion thruster. We're gonna have more offline time or more lost time in the satellite if we've got an ion thruster on there. Um, you can make the ion thrusters uh, potentially operate at ISP similar to hull thrusters, and I'll just say that to, to kind of cover any commercial investitures. I don't wanna, I don't wanna say the wrong thing. Um, okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, are there other considerations too with volume, um, like one being a little, a little bit larger than the other, or are they all pretty much kind of the same? Um, they're they're not. If if you wanted to just breadboard um, out on my desk here, um, an EP system, and you breadboarded out a hull uh, system, and then uh, next to it you breaded out uh, a gridded iron system. I believe it is probably true that you would end up with a larger gridded ion breadboard system. A lot of that has to do, uh, a lot of that um, sort of qualitative, intuitive arguing number has, has to do with the size of the um, power supply, the PPU and the job right. that it has to do. A, a PPU for a gridded ion thruster is, is complicated in that it, it has really got to produce a lot of different output voltages and those output voltage, each of those is a power supply, uh, have to have different current carrying capabilities. I mean, you're talking about a table full of power supplies if you're trying to do this in a lab, right? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, um, uh, contrast that with a hull thruster. Now, the hull thruster doesn't really have a uh, big PPU volume requirement. Uh, that is not to uh, minimize the, the problem that the PPU uh, folks face. And my gosh, is it a problem because uh, what you're essentially doing is uh, you're turning up the voltage between the cathode and the anode of a hull thruster to some operating voltage, three, four, five hundred volts, probably wouldn't be surprising numbers. And then you have to superimpose on top of that sort of a sawtooth waveform um, until the cathode arcs. Hmm. And when the cathode arcs, now you're, bust, you're gangbusters for current. So you went from being totally open circuit power supply at a really high voltage to now you want to maintain that voltage and not have it sag too much, but you've got to deliver a heck of a lot of current. You know, that's a tough power supply uh, problem to, to, to overcome. And, um, you know, uh, especially whenever you look at the ignition characteristics um, of a hull thruster, the, the IV curve, so to speak. If you want to think about a resistor, it's got an IV curve that's just a straight line. A hull thruster's IV curve is, is, is not a straight line, okay? <laughs> it, it's not a straight line. Um, it, it's a very, very chaotic, um, we'll just call it a waveform in the most general sense. It's, it's, a, it's a really, really chaotic thing. And accommodating that in a box is pretty darn hard. Um, but it's smaller. It's, it's a smaller power supply. Um, so whenever you breadboard those things out, I would say hull thruster is probably smaller than, than gridded ion thruster. 
does that translate into uh, any any volumetric benefit for uh, a mission designer, a payload designer, somebody like you? Um, no, I would say no. It does not translate into into a benefit for you guys um, because um, you lose a lot of fidelity in integration, right? Uh, I think that's the right way to say it. Yeah. Um, it. It's really more how you integrate the spacecraft that is going to govern um, how big the individual components are. How you integrate your EP system is driven by other considerations like thermal. Thermal is a big, a big problem uh, whenever you look at something like a Hall thruster compared to a gridded ion thruster. Gridded ion thruster, the electron temperature, uh, you can think of that as a surrogate metric for how hot the thruster is if you want. Uh, the electron temperature in a, uh, a gridded ion thruster is, uh, is very low. It can be a couple of EV uh, electron volts potentially. That means the plasma is running about 20, 23,000 Kelvin. Um, yeah, um, so you can have that. Contrast that though, so that sounds really, really hot. And, and I wanted to say 23,000 for wow factor, you know, whatever. Uh, right. <laughs> sorry, I can't, I can't stop being a, a lecturer and a teacher and, and that makes me a little bit grandstandy, I think sometimes. No, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so, so contrast that with uh, a hall thruster whose electron temperature is somewhere in the neighborhood of 25, maybe even higher, maybe even 50 whenever you run these really, really high voltage uh, hall right. thrusters. You've got yeah. this really, really high electron um, population temperature. Uh, couple that with the fact that the average density of a hall thruster is going to be enormously bigger than the average density of a gridded ion thruster, which has implications for its overall specific heat capacity on your spacecraft. Um, so you're going to end up with this uh, really, really hot hall thruster that stays really, really hot for a really, really long time, right? Contrast that with your, your grid ion thruster that has substantially less thermal demands. So whenever I say it gets swamped in integration, I think that any volumetric argument you can make one way or the other is a wash. So I was looking at pictures of these, and one thing that I noticed is that Hall effect thrusters just look like straight tubes, whereas PPTs mm. and ion thrusters, they have that diffuser. And so I didn't know if there was a... I mean, I would assume it's just based on the physics, but like a specific reason why Hall thrusters don't need that area expansion in order to, to get the thrust that, that they need. There really is. And uh, I, I mean, I want to say out loud that you, I didn't feed you that question. Uh, that, that's a really <laughs> great question. It, it's another one of what I regard as kind of the cornerstones and understanding for electric propulsion. Um, there are really fundamentally three different types of electric propulsion thrusters. Um, there's a hair dryer, a hull thruster, and uh, an electromagnetic thruster, uh, like a PPT. Uh, and I was being a little flippant there. I said there's a hair dryer. Uh, <laughs> if, if you don't want to be flippant and you want to be a little more professional, uh, then you, you call this a, a resistive jet. Uh, <laughs> okay. um, so uh, it does exactly what you think it does. It takes the electrical energy. It is definitely an electric propulsion device. It takes that electrical energy, but it just converts it directly to enthalpy, mm -hmm. just like your bond energy did from your chemical reaction a minute ago. So if I told you that I was gonna give you a, a resistor jet or uh, any kind of these electro-resistive sort of um, engines, arc jet falls into that category. Um, if, I, if I told you that, that I'm gonna convert this into enthalpy, wouldn't you expect me to put some kind of a nozzle on it? That thing that you called a diffuser earlier, Sarah, that's, that's a nozzle. Um, because oh, the okay. because the gas, I know it it it, uh, it it looks like a diffuser. Oh, okay. But it's actually uh, the the exhaust portion of a Dale Wall nozzle, just like a rocket engine. Right. Okay. Right. Um, but anyway, yeah. So that uh, that supersonic expansion uh, portion there has that uh, diffusive nozzle uh, on the end there uh, to recover thrust from enthalpy. What nozzles do? They're a thermodynamic simple machine. They convert uh, one kind of energy into another kind. Um, in this case, they're converting enthalpy that's created by your resistor. Uh, that is to say, it's heating up the gas, from adding enthalpy to the gas. It's converting that enthalpy into jet kinetic power. Uh, that is to say, a mass flowing quickly. Um, that's what a nozzle does. So a resistor jet in that way can, be, can really just be thought of as a, a couple of different energy converters. The first thing it's do, uh, a resistor jet would be doing is converting electrical energy into heat, into um, uh, 
thermal uh, flux uh, over the surface of a resistor. Right? That thermal flux is going to warm up that gas, so you get an enthalpy transfer. Got some, uh, so that first machine is producing enthalpy from electrical energy. That's conversion number one. Conversion number two in any kind of a, a resistor jet is going to be the conversion of your enthalpy into jet kinetic power. Uh, that's how you recover thrust. And that's what the nozzle does. So that's the second piece in the chain. Um, an arc jet is another type of, uh, of device along with a PPT uh, that we'll need to talk about um, in a little more depth. Um, but uh, an arc jet uh, does very much the same thing, but it gets away from the limitation that you've probably already put together in your head. You've said to yourself in your head already, geez, I really don't like these resistor jet things for general applications. And the reason is I'm going to melt that resistor every time because I want that gas to be as hot as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so you've said this to yourself and you said, that's a real limitation uh, to the resistor jet. I think I can do better. And the answer is absolutely you can do better. Uh, get rid of that material resistor. Instead of doing that, why don't you heat up an arc, an electrical arc? Uh, make that thing your resistor because it has no, uh, no intrinsic temperature limitation. Um, so you can flow your gas over an arc in lieu of a resistor. Uh, and, and achieve exactly the same effect, but you can achieve that effect at much, much higher temperatures. So what that means is you can add more enthalpy to the gas and, and thereby extract more genetic, jet kinetic power. So we've improved on the resistor jet. Um, there are improvements on, on the, the arc jet a, as well, um, but uh, those are uh, mostly um, a plasma phase uh, devices. So rather than uh, the, the next sort of logical leap, if you must make one uh, for your mission, is uh, the, the Vasmir loop. Um, uh, the leap is, um, I, I, I have some cathode and, and anode problems with my arc jet. Turns out whenever you drive infinity current through an arc, it constricts down to zero uh, 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 radius and is carrying you know, infinite energy and zero radius and uh, electrodes don't like that. Um, so I wanna do better than an arc jet. And I still wanna do this resistive or this uh, uh, resistor heating up the gas, converting enthalpy, sort of a, a, a gig. I want to be on that train. Well, okay, um, we can do that. Uh, what we've got to do though is strip the uh, is heat up the gas, the entire gas, so much that we strip the electrons off of it. So we we drive the train to its the logical end of the tracks. You heat up a gas so much that it's not a gas anymore. But all you're doing, all you're capitalizing on, is the fact that this thing is just an enthalpy. So yeah, man, you're heating up the gas, you're stripping these electrons off, it's undergoing a phase change. I mean, for those of you who are uh, kind of more conversant with uh, uh, continuous uh, fluids and thermodynamics and things like that, uh, a phase change uh, is an enormous amount of enthalpy suck being sucked up that doesn't increase temperature. It's just like water boiling, right? Uh, so whenever you go through and you ionize this gas, depending on how much you heat it up after that, you may be doing yourself kind of a disservice. Uh, because you're losing all this energy in a phase change that you may not be able to capitalize on completely. Um, uh, there's a great argument to be made that um, uh, you know, there may be a limit to that argument. Uh, it may not go uh, go quite as far as I want it to. But um, uh, anyway, uh, uh, just to, just to stay on track here, yeah, that's the uh, and that's the logical end in my mind, um, where the entire gas is ionized and you're now still doing enthalpy. That is the logical end of. Uh, resistor jets, uh, and I'll just call them resistor jets as a family, uh, if you like. It is also arc jets. Um, there's another uh, family, though, Sarah, and I hope that explains why one uh, thing, the PPT, would look different than a hall thruster and gridded ion thruster. I hope you see now that the PPT must intrinsically have some electrothermal component. Mm -hmm. um, hall thrusters and gridded ion thrusters do not, and the reason for that is they are not enthalpy converters. They're converting electrical energy into jet kinetic power, a fundamentally different physical quantity. Um, so the mechanistically, uh, that acceleration, that accelerator, uh, it, it looks different, it looks different. Um, uh, one great uh, follow-up question, I'm, I'm sure that's already on your mind, is, um, well, geez, you know, uh, Daniel, if, uh, if a hall thruster and a grid ion thruster, you're telling me they're in the same family and they're using the same acceleration mechanism. I, I think I'm going to have to call uh, BS on you because uh, why do they look different? <laughs> why is one of them shaped like a donut and why is one of them, you know, this, this funky grid uh, structure? And um, the answer is 
it's the way I'm applying my electric field. Um, that's that's really fundamentally the thing. The uh, the mechanism, mechanistically uh, here, what, what's accelerating our, our our ions is an electric field. That's how we're we're getting them to speed up, right? So in gridded ion thrusters, the way we choose to apply that electric field uh, by design, I mean, intentionally, we chose this way. The way we choose to apply the electric field is just different than the way a hall thruster. Um, I'm sorry, I keep looking at my microphone and not looking at you, sir. Um, <laughs> the, the mechanism, uh, but uh, the way that we're applying that potential difference, it isn't uh, uh, between two uh, material grid structures. We don't do it that way in a hall thruster. What we do is we have a retarding magnetic field that impedes the flow of electrons. So you end up with basically a static cloud um, on the outside of a hall thruster. You got which I mean I'm I'm. I may be horrifying people by oversimplifying this much, but I'm, I'm trying my best here. So you end up with a, a static field of kind of electrons, if you want to think about it that way, that's sort of outside uh, around the exit plane of the thruster, right? Uh, you got this, this static cloud hovering around. All these xenon ions that you then inject from the back, from the bottom uh, of the, the donut, all of those that get their electrons stripped off, now they see this static field on the outside of, uh, uh, of the thruster that's now impeded, uh, the electrons can't flow through the channel, they can't trickle down through the channel because the magnetic field is like pudding. They can't, they can't, they force their way through it eventually, but it, it sure takes them a long time to sort of diffuse through. Um, so that's how, that's how we're applying our electric field in a, in a hall thruster. Um, and why would we do it that way? Well, um, it turns out that uh, apply, having material electrical uh, grids, like in, we do in a gridded ion thruster, there's a limit to how much current you can have between those grids so that ions will still see a potential difference. If you fill that gap up with a lot of ions because you're accelerating them, other ions back here, they don't see any more field because the other ions are sort of hot, or the ions in, in between the plates are sort of hot in it all. Uh, they don't see any reason to accelerate toward the grids anymore. And that's called the child Langmuir limit. Um, you can't flow an infinite amount of current through, uh, through the, the, the grids like that. Uh, hall thrusters get away from this because we don't have these material grids. Um, there's a, a trail of, uh, a rosy trail of physics that I could walk you down here. Um, because you don't have those grids uh, in between there, you, you obviate, you eliminate uh, this child Langmuir limit. So you can flow, um, I mean, in principle, as much current as you want but you never say that, you never get anything as much as you want. Uh, there are other limits that you run into. Oh, that's awesome. I never... Um, I think it's yeah. really neat to oh, be that's really cool. sorry to talk over you, but uh, I just got to nerd out a little bit more. <laughs> I think it's really neat to be able to kind of tell the story uh, of all of these uh, electric propulsion uh, thrusters as kind of logical evolution. Season going all the way back to this dichotomy, uh, this problem that we see between chemical rockets and nuclear rockets. It's going all the way back to there. Um, the reason that I think that hull thrusters and gridded ion thrusters were kind of a more monumental difference um, is, is it feels like the tree of electric propulsion kind of almost, I guess, diverges there fundamentally. And the reason I say that is because it diverges fundamentally in terms of its ability to meet mission needs. Hmm. Um, Hall thrusters um, will be able, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm kind of, I'm trying to push some 90% some formed ideas here. Uh, Hall thrusters can be driven uh, to, to higher ISPs, but they will always have better scaling when it comes to delivering thrust. When you need a bigger force, you're always kind of kind of want to go toward hall thrusters. I mean, integration issues and other things on the spacecraft are just sort of always going to logically drive you that way. Whereas, um, whenever you can wait, whenever you can afford to wait, or whenever your mission timeline, uh, flying a grid ion thruster to Pluto, for, for goodness sake, um, whenever your mission timeline is so big, there is really no choice except a grid ion thruster. And the reason is, uh, in terms of an optimum sort of solution, and, and the reason I would say is because you can't drive hall thrusters to an arbitrary voltage um, limit, uh, an arbitrary ISP, therefore. Um, they can't, they have a, a, a sort of a limit uh, to how high they can go. And it has to do with limitations of uh, this acceleration mechanism we, we use. There are limitations associated with this diffusion uh, of electrons through the field uh, sort of mechanism. Um, that, that limit us to the limit us to, to some ISPs in order to keep uh, efficiency in 
the bounds. Whenever we go to thinking about bigger missions, interstellar missions, uh, you know, out, out, and I just mean, I don't mean going to Alpha Centauri, I just mean leaving sort of the gravitational influence of the sun. Uh, like a, a thousand AU mission is one that NASA uh, explored at one point in time. Um, whenever you look at those kind of missions, uh, Sarah, there's never going to be, uh, if you're going EP, a nuclear EP, um, there's never going to be an option, I think, that's going to beat a hull, beat a gridded ion thruster in terms of delivering that optimum ISP uh, okay. for your mission. Now, there are some things like timelines that you can easily push back on. Uh, so I think this really deserves to be more of an open discussion with other voices than my own. But uh, I think that is a compelling argument. I really do. I'm, man, I'm like, I'm nerding out over this. I think you have converted me to the dark side. <laughs> this is really cool. Well, that concludes part one of this series on electric propulsion. If you enjoyed this interview and you want to continue learning more about it, go and check out part two, which includes more information on how these systems are designed, as well as how they're tested and some lessons learned along the way. Now, there's a wealth of really great information in these episodes. And after doing this, all I can say is, in the spirit of Jesse Pinkman, yeah, Mr. White, yeah, science. And if you don't know what that reference is from, go and watch Breaking Bad immediately because you are missing out on Vince Gilligan's creative genius. And as a side note, if you would like a dumpster fire candle of your own to show your love for 2020, I will include a link to that in the description below. The scents may sound kind of weird, but they actually smell pretty good. Or at least I can vouch for the coffee and cigarettes one. And that's all for this episode, so don't forget to leave this a rating, and I'll see you back in two weeks on a new topic. Cheers, Sarah.